ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Dark Phoenix Gaming Top 10 Games of 2019. Now, as the name should tell you, this is a list of my top games of this year, but before I get started, there's a few things I need to cover. A couple of caveats, if you will. First of all, barely any of these games were actually released in 2019. This is not necessarily a list of my favorite games that came out this year, because I didn't actually buy many new games this year. I bought plenty of old ones, but not many new ones. So this list is just for the top 10 games I played in 2019. If I played it for more than an hour this year and I enjoyed it, then it is a potential candidate for this list. Also, this is my opinion. I don't expect you to agree with me. I don't expect you to even like half these games. If you don't, that's fine. But I swear, if I hear the phrase, your opinion is wrong, I will fucking lose it. With that out of the way, let's move on to number 10. And in at number 10, we have Imperator Rome. Yes, I expect this one will be a bit controversial. Because, for very good reasons, Imperator Rome was not well liked at release, and is still a little bit iffy. But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. <clears throat> I've always been kind of a fan of Roman and classical history, and that did admittedly make me a little bit biased in favor of this game, so that will be part of why I like it so much, yes. But also, whenever I play Paradox games, the things that I'm always looking for are emergent narratives and the opportunity to let your actions and the actions of the AI within that campaign create the story. And despite all of its flaws, despite the problems it undoubtedly have, did have, Imperator Rome did a very good job at that. It could certainly do better. The stories between characters are still not really there, but they're getting there. And the stories between nations, between empires, if you will, are definitely still excellent. And it's the sort of unfolding narrative on that level that I really enjoyed. And hopefully Imperator will improve over time, but for now, it holds a fairly comfortable spot at my number 10 place, I think. But now, let's move on to number 9, Mountain Blade Warband. Yeah, like I said, barely anything on this list is something that came out this year, and this one is years and years old at this point. But I still love it. Mountain Blade, for those of you who have never played, the best way I can describe it is it's a... It's basically what you would get if you were playing a Total War game, but instead of the overarching overall commander of everything, you were playing as one of the soldiers on the ground. Or possibly as the general. That's what this is. As the name suggests, you build up your war band and essentially, essentially you start out as a bunch of mercenaries doing odd jobs, killing bandits and stuff, maintain things, and eventually you want to get to the point where you either swear fealty to a king and work on their behalf, or found your own kingdom by attacking one of them. 
or swear fealty to a king, work on your own behalf to get a bunch of territory, and then when they don't give you what you want, you declare your independence and make yourself a king. One of them, anyways. I've never gotten overly far into the actual story, and I'm doing air quotes here, by the way. I've never gotten all that far into it, because this can be a very long game. I've heard it said and seen a couple of Let's Plays suggesting that actually managing to conquer the entire map can take hundreds and hundreds of hours. I've gotten to the point where I owned maybe three castles, and that's about it, but just the atmosphere and... Like in Paradox Games, the narrative and emergent stories are my favorite aspects, because it doesn't need to have a good story, because I make my own. I mean, what other game is there, and there are probably a few, where you can have stories like the time that you run across a lord in the field who's being overwhelmed by bandits, send all your cavalry to ride them down. <laughs> then he expresses your, his gratitude. It turns out that lord is the king of the region you're currently in. You swear fealty. He makes you a lord. And then, and thanks to your efforts, his kingdom conquers the entire known world. That's the sort of stories you can get out of Mountain Blade, and that is why I love it. But now, let's move on to number eight, Vampire. This is one of the few games on my list that actually came out in 2019, making it a rarity. Rarity indeed. And the name should fairly easily tell you what this is about. You play as a vampire named Dr. Jonathan Raid. It might be Reed, actually. I've never been too clear on the pronunciation. <clears throat> but you play as a vampire who's also a doctor. And this game does one thing that I think is really cool. The actual game mechanics are baked into the story. So there's a mechanic in this game where you can drain, pe you can drink people's blood, but by doing so you will kill them. But also, you get more out of them, more blood and experience, if you will if you know that person well. So, just to give you an example, and this is not even remotely related to any characters in the game, I should mention, if you were to drain Sally down the street, who you just met five minutes ago, you would get a respectable amount of experience, but if you knew that uh, Sally was the daughter of the local beggar, and because he wasn't getting as much money off of <clears throat> begging as he would like. She's had to become a prostitute to help pay the bills, and she, now she has syphilis. If you were to learn about her, then you would get so much more out of it. But, of course, the flip side of that is that now you know about her. You know who this person is and everything, so you don't necessarily want to drain them now. So it's the flip between, do you learn more about these people and then maybe have to push through your reluctance because now you know them as people rather than them just being sacks of blood and experience? Or do you just drain them without knowing much? And then there's another concept something called Pillars of the Community. These are the people who are really just keeping things going, is the best way to put it. They're the ones who are keeping the community 
that they're operating in. They're keeping things chugging along. They are the ones making things stay stable because the setting this takes place in, and I probably should have explained this before, it's set in the middle of a out in the out it's set in the middle of the outbreak of the Spanish flu in London in 1918. <clears throat> so these people are the ones keeping things operating reasonably well and if you kill them, it makes keeping the community stable very difficult and you can potentially have the entire city descend into anarchy if you kill enough people or the right people or wrong people depending on how you look at it <clears throat> and how many districts end up like this as well as just how you, how many people you kill and such that sort of thing will actually determine the way the game ends for you and I love it when games do this when your choices have actual consequences rather than just sort of being a thing that happens but with that mammoth essay about vampire out of the way Let's move on <clears throat> to my number seven. And at number seven, we have Dishonored. Yeah, we're back into games that didn't come out this year, but what do you expect from me? Now, Dishonored is a game that I've played a couple of times before. I did a Let's Play of it earlier this year, but I also did my own playthrough way back when, and really enjoyed that. <laughs> it is, at this moment in time, one of my favorite stealth games basically ever. It just has so many options and there's so much variety to the stealth and everything that I can't help but love it. And the whole concept, again, of the ending and based on what you do because the chaos system sort of blend, and I should explain that. The chaos system is basically how murdery are you being? Are you trying to spare as many people as you can and only killing when it's absolutely necessary? Or are you just going on a brutal rampage and slaughtering absolutely everybody? Because if you decide to to murder everybody, then you get the bad ending, where Emily, the heir to the throne and the little girl you're protecting, because it does something interesting in that Emily is watching how you behave, and your actions will shape what she sees as the right path to take. If she, Emily sees you just carving a bloody path through everything in your way, then she'll take that to mean that you can solve more problems with violence than with negotiations and become essentially a tyrannical butcher of an empress when she takes the throne. On the other hand, if you're more, if you're not quite so heavy-handed with your approach, then she'll take the opposite. <sighs> approach to that and be more light more of a light touch and more diplomatic and it's just really interesting how the way you play affects the ending in this even though there aren't any actual choices in the traditional way uh, with Dishonored, the magic system is also very interesting to me because, uh, for one thing, it's optional. You can choose to not use the magic system, and provided you upgrade your uh, athletics ability, I, th I forget what it's called, but the thing that lets you jump higher, 
I think you can avoid using the magic system at all, except for the little tutorial you get for it. I think... Th I'm not sure, though. There might be one area other than that where you have to use the ability it gives you. I do not know. But the other thing than that is just... There's so much variety to everything. All the levels are so well done, and, and despite some little flaws, like the enemy AI not immediately becoming suspicious if you poke your head around something, this game has one of the best AIs for enemy guards and patrols, because they will actually notice if you knock one of their guys unconscious and hide them, they'll notice that there is not someone patrolling along that route. And they will go to check it out. Which is such a novel concept, and it makes the stealth and sneaking something you have to be a bit more engaged in than just you knock out one guy and you're good. This is just so much better. And I know I'm just kind of gushing about Dishonored, but I really cannot say enough good things about this game. But with that, let's move on to number six. And at number six, we have Steel Division Normandy 44. Now, Steel Division, as the name will suggest to you, is a World War II strategy game, but Unlike a lot of World War II strategy games, it differs in the tone and setting because a lot of these strategy games, World War II strat games, a lot of them are based on the grand overarching uh, uh, actual war, as in plans for the entire front line and everything. Steel Division is based on individual battles. You're the commander of a group of... Uh, you're the commander of an army for a single battle, and you have to fight and win that battle. It does have a single-player campaign, but I never really played it that much, nor did I find it that engaging. I really prefer the skirmish more than anything else against the AI. And the best way I can describe the battles that you fight in this game is anyone who's played Hearts of Iron 4, you are essentially playing out the battles that occur whenever your forces and the enemy forces meet on the front line. You are playing out every single one of those battles in a skirmish. That's what you're doing in this, basically. And there are enough unit types to give it plenty of variety, so it's actually possible for you to have a full battle. And the armies are varied enough to be really interesting. You have some armies, like the Germans, Americans, and British, that are pretty good all-rounders. And there are others, like the Polish army. And the uh, Polish armies that you can uh, create, which they have plenty of infantry and the like, but barely any tanks. Because the battles operate on a phase system, where as you go on you gain points and can deploy more units. And there are some armies, as I said, like the Polish, who <laughs> the longer the battles go on, the more disadvantaged they will be because they don't have a lot of armored units and they deploy more infantry than armor so as more enemy armor starts to get on the field they'll become more vulnerable and more likely to be defeated <laughs> so it really <clears throat> makes you think and have to switch up your strategy based on 
which particular armory you are fielding and who you're going up against. But with that, let's move on to number five. And in at number five, we have Nerim at Fate's Edge. Now, Nerim is not actually a game in the strictest sense of the term. It is a total conversion mod for the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. And it's... Uh, however, despite being a total conversion mod, Nerim is, in my honest opinion, as good as some full games I've played, so I decided that it deserves a spot on this list. I actually did a full Let's Play of Nerim earlier this year, and I will leave a link down in the description for that, so you can go and check that out. It is in German, though, but it does have English subtitles. This is a German mod, however, it has one of the best stories of anything that I have ever played, and really, my words aren't going to do it justice. You really need to play this for yourself. All I will say is this. Nerim is fairly heavily focused around the main story. There are a small number of side quests, but at the same time, those side quests aren't the focus. This isn't like... Oblivion Vanilla, where you have a ton of side quests that you do alongside the main quest. Side quests are a little brief distraction that you get sometimes. The main quest is the real focus. Because the thing with the main quest is... In Nerim, you exist in a world where using magic is a crime. Thanks to the government having outlawed it. And... You're a member of a group of rebels for part of it. It sort of changes as things go on, but <clears throat> the main overarching theme is there is a group of gods who are not really gods, who you've been told are tyrants, and your main objective after a certain point in the story is to help them be overthrown by the man who managed to kill one of them, and things just sort of evolve from there. I'm trying to avoid giving out too many spoilers, because this is the sort of thing you really need to experience for yourself. Nerim has one of the best stories I have ever experienced in a game full stop. And it, ha it does twists and turns and surprises in the best way possible. It, and forgive me for the f cliched phrase, subverts your expectations, but it does it in a way that's good. These are excellent surprises that add to the storytelling rather than just making it dumb. And yes, that was me taking a little pot shot at Last Jedi. Deal with it. So now... On to number four. And in at number four, we have XCOM 2. Yeah, anyone who's been watching this channel for a while now, either on Twitch or on YouTube, knows that I am a bit of an XCOM fanboy. I spent a lot of time this year and last year playing XCOM 2 both on and off camera, because for a while I had an ongoing live stream series. <clears throat> but it ended after I took too long of a break and got bad at the game. So yeah. But uh, XCOM 2 is one of my favorite games ever, as you may notice from the list. So far, I've put roughly a hundred hours into the game itself, and that's probably just going to keep going up. So yes, I've spent rather a lot of time playing this game, is what I'm saying. And for a long time, I didn't really like 
turn-based strategy games, because the concept seemed boring. Why would I want to move my guys, wait for my enemy to move theirs, and then rinse and repeat, rather than have us all moving everything simultaneously? But XCOM Enemy Unknown is what converted me to a turn-based strategy lover. And XCOM 2 is, if you ask me, even better than the first one. And when I say the first one, I'm referring to Enemy Unknown and Enemy Within, obviously. <sighs> yeah, I just love the way they do the concept of the aliens beat us, so now we have to rebuild XCOM. <sighs> they could have done a little bit more with the guerrilla warfare side of things, and having us have to steal XCOM stuff, uh, steal the aliens' technology, because X what XCOM produced wasn't that good. They could have done something along that line to make it more interesting, but it's still an excellent game, and <laughs> absolutely amazing, and War of the Chosen just makes everything even more epic. Yeah, can you tell I'm a bit of an XCOM fanboy? Because I am. Anyways. On to the next item on the list, I think. And at number three, we have Hearts of Iron 4. I spent a lot of time playing Hearts of Iron 4 this year, but most of that time was actually in the very excellent Kaiserreich mod. Kaiserreich Legacy of the Wilt Krieg is the best mod ever, and I will fight you if you disagree. <clears throat> but Hearts of Iron, even in its vanilla form, is quite fun, and I enjoy it. <clears throat> even though there are some legitimate arguments saying that it is not quite as complicated and complex as Hearts of Iron 3. I don't actually mind, because I was never able to get into Hearts of Iron 3. It was just too complicated for me to really get. But, to borrow a phrase from a good friend of mine, complicated and complex are not the same thing. Hearts of Iron 4, in my opinion, has plenty of complexity has uh, plenty of complexity, it's just not as complicated and easier to get into. Those are the main things. Plus, some of the mechanical systems that they've changed up I think are actually for the better. For one thing, from a mechanical and thematic standpoint. Just to give you an example, Hearts of Iron 3, you used industrial capacity for basically everything. You used industrial capacity to build your ships. And the fact that you have actual shipyards for that in Hearts of Iron 4 is, to me, definitely an improvement. And I do understand that a lot of people want to micromanage and assign every level of their command divisions and I think that it's just a map painting game now, which it kind of is to a degree, every country being kind of playable, and it being possible to use anything, but I don't play Hearts of Iron to min-max or anything. I play it, as I said, like old Paradox games, for the emergent storytelling, so the fact that it's possible to min-max and conquer the world as Luxembourg or whatever doesn't bother me because that's not something I would ever do. Sorry if that disappoints you, but that's just the way I play it, and of course I am going to tout my preferred playstyle over what is a possible playstyle for others. That's just the way it is. But now let's move on to number two. And in at number two, we have Baldur's Gate. This should be no surprise to anyone who watched my Let's Play, but at this point, Baldur's Gate is 
basically one of my favorite games of all time, and if not for Baldur's Gate 2, it would be my favorite. But I think 2 has eclipsed that spot. Baldur's Gate, though, as far as narrative and storytelling and interesting characters are concerned, is absolutely brilliant. My love of this game, I will freely admit, is almost entirely down to the story. I played it on normal difficulty, so I didn't do it for the challenge, and I've only ever played one other CRPG ever in my life, and that was Tyranny, so I kind of did things in reverse order, admittedly, playing Tyranny before Pillars of Eternity and Baldur's Gate, but the storytelling and the way they introduced new parts of the plot and new twists in this game was just the best. It really, really was. And I just loved the fact that there was always something. You always thought you were getting a grip on where things were going, then it immediately veered off in a direction you could never have foreseen. In a lot of games, that sort of twist could be annoying or it's unwarranted, but here it just seemed to fit. And my favorite thing was also a just down to a way they characterized the villains. Because the villains in Baldur's Gate, they never actually thought they were villains. They thought they were doing the right thing for the most part. I mean, Saravok is the exception, but just take the Shadow Druids, for example. They didn't see themselves as evil. They saw themselves as doing good, and that just enhanced them all the more, because Evil people don't generally think they're evil, basically is what I'm getting at here, and the fact that Baldur's Gate could emphasize that so well really helped with its storytelling, I think. And that's definitely a large part of why I enjoyed it. But now, after all my rambling on these various games, which has taken us over the half an hour mark, it is finally time for us to hit my number one item on the list. But before we get to number one, I have a few honorable mentions. Things that didn't quite make it onto the list, but I think deserve some special mention because I've been playing and enjoying them rather a lot. First, we have Darkest Dungeon. That's a game I've been playing on and off a little bit here and there, but while I enjoy it, it was never quite on the level with these other games, so I didn't feel I could justify putting it on this list. Second, we have Phantom Doctrine, a game that I picked up only very recently. And as enjoyable as it is, I've only played it for about two or three hours, so I didn't feel I could properly do it justice just yet and that is why it is not on this list. However, I am looking forward to experiencing more of it, and just to sort of give a brief synopsis for those of you who don't know what Phantom Doctrine is, it's similar to XCOM in that it is a turn-based strategy game. It's set in the Cold War, and in a rather interesting twist for strategy games, part of the major concept is actually avoiding detection and not getting into giant firefights with each other. Because you are supposed to be stealth operatives, not special ops soldiers, so that's a thing. Finally, for my special mentions, we have Total War Warhammer 2. I've always been a bit of a, a Total War fan, and I have spent a good deal of time playing Warhammer 2 this year, but as much as I've been enjoying it, I haven't put as many hours into the game this year as I have previous years. And there were just other things that I was enjoying more this time around. 
which is why it is not on this list. Also, the fact that outside the game, I know basically nothing about the Warhammer Fantasy universe, and I know some people would complain if I didn't gush about that as well in here. That may also be part of it. But I think that will do it for my honorable mentions, so let's move on to my number one item on the list. And number one should come as no surprise to anyone who knows me. And at number one is Stellaris. Yeah. At this point, I am basically obsessed with Stellaris. That is the honest truth. I am obsessed with this game. So far, I've played Stellaris for nearly 840 hours. I've owned this game since release, and it's one of my favorite of all time. Like all other Paradox games, the creative storytelling you can do within the game and the emergent narrative are the things that really draw me in. But, unlike Imperator Rome and even Hearts of Iron, and even Crusader Kings 2 to a degree, the emergent narrative in Stellaris can really take on another dimension because you have elements like the Shroud, Fanatical Purifiers, and these other empires that just want to genocide your entire species. You have all of this stuff. It just makes everything take on a whole new dimension. And... Well, I just can't say enough good things about that. Anyway... It just helps because you can have stories like... You had to start next to a race of murderous bugs who want to devour your entire population. And you're frantically building up your navy to be able to take them out. You can have all of these stories. And beyond that, just the little character interactions. Characters aren't a massive focus in Stellaris because your empire and the customization you can do on that end for role-playing is more the focus. But they just help to flesh out the story and I can confidently say in Stellaris, I've never had any two games where I started in even remotely similar situations. I really have not. That is, it's really just one of the best gameplay experiences I have ever had. And I know a lot of people have not been happy with some of the recent expansions. There was a lot of outcry concerning how they got rid of most of the original FTL types, but I actually liked the removal of everything but hyperlanes, because I just feel like it made the uh, warfare a lot more tactical to have to uh, make use of hyperlane instead of having all the different FTL types. Besides, I always used Hyperlane only myself, so that didn't bother me. And as for the population update, I really prefer the population now. That added to the roleplay immensely for a number of reasons. The important one being the fact that overpopulation is actually a thing now. So you don't just have planets that are perfectly full or growing towards perfectly full. You can actually have them be overpopulated, which is very realistic and, again, adds to the storytelling and emergent narrative because that gives you another reason to search for new colonies and another little story about how your empire was running out of space and needed room for its people to live, so either you started a war with a neighbor to take their planets from them, 
so you could populate them with your own species, or you created your own new planets for your people to live on, depending on which route you decided to take. So yes, I've said this before, and I've said it again, but Stellaris is absolutely my favorite game of all time at this point, and I do not see that changing anytime soon. I really do not. But at this point, I'm just basically gushing about how awesome Stellaris is, so I think we had better end this here. Thank you for watching my top 10 list for this year. I will try to actually get this out in 2019, but no promises. In any case, I will see you next time for whatever video of mine you decide to watch next. See you then, everybody. I'll see you then.